sweet. I'd like to call this meeting to order. It is now 3.41 p.m. Um, uh, is there anything else to a call to order that might have happened from there? I'm new at this. Uh, you should say the name of the committee. Great. This is the Fort River School Building Committee. Um, this is our second meeting, December 14th from uh, from now until 5.30 p.m. Um, we're in the Fort River Elementary School Library, uh, and we have our agenda here. Um, our first item is to approve minutes of the previous meeting. Can we go to there? Do I have to do anything else first? I don't know that we have minutes to yeah. approve the no, previous have... meeting. Okay. Due to, the, due to the circumstances that the previous meeting was not actually a real meeting, okay. I don't think there are any actual real minutes to approve. Great. I'm going to cross that off and call it good. Thank you. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so this is the moment when we can take public comment. We have no members of the public here. Thank you, except our fabulous volunteer. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So uh, our next item is to re-vote um, for the position of chair. Uh, has everyone here done the swearing in stuff and the open meeting law forms and the conflict of interest things? There's like all those things we have to do. Uh, no, okay. I'm not, but as ex officio, I don't know if I need to. If you're, if you're not actually not serving on the committee and non voting, I don't think you need to. I think that. Okay. Yeah. Um, anybody who knows more about this stuff, please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Well, yeah, as far as the open meeting and the conflict of interest. I think we have a two-week window to finish that up. Yeah, yeah I know you do. Before today, but cool. But, the, but this isn't like news to anybody that that stuff needs to get done. No. Okay. Okay. Thank great. you. Cool. And you have a quorum of people who have done that. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, so, revoting for chair. Um, I nominated myself to be the chair. Uh, I'm not sure what procedure is for. Are you going to Are you going to call open nominations? Sure. I would like to call open nominations for the position of chair. I'd like, I'd like to nominate Nicole Singer to be chair. A second. A second. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's more fun than nominating yourself. Isn't I'm it? Totally <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll accept that nomination. Uh, anybody else nominations for self or someone else? Sweet. Um, Should we move to vote? Am, close, am I allowed to close nominations? Close nominations. Nominations are closed. Cool. Now we now we vote. All right. All in favor of having me be the chair? Sweet. All right. Good. Thanks, everybody. Um, yes. And I think I need to just say the all opposed. Yeah. And okay. yeah. All right. All right. Uh, it, it is unanimous that I am the chair. Cool. Um, we also have to revote for the invoice for Amherst Media, namely to pay it. Um, this is to pay, pay for the um, training of volunteers to do the, um, the broadcasting for Amherst Media. Um, do we need more details on this? Or I think because this, it, sorry, it, yeah, it has to be recognized because it is going to be another official meeting of the college. Right. Right. You should just say, reiterate what it's about. Okay, if that's okay. Sure. I can sure. go ahead. To that. So, um, filming of uh, this committee's meetings uh, cannot be done uh, by any of the contracts that currently exist at Amherst Media, so therefore it has to be done by volunteers. Those volunteers have to be Amherst Media members, which requires a membership fee. Um, the training fee has been waived by Amherst Media to do this. Uh, there have been three people that have been trained to do this at a cost of $35 each, and that comes to a total of $105. Um, so that's what is being requested to be paid now. However, if other people would like to volunteer, it's always good to have more folks. So again, a plea for people to uh, let us know. Uh, you can let me know, or let the chair know, or Deb Westmoreland, and we can make that happen. So, $105 for Amherst Media for training of three people. Thank you. Yes? I move to um, authorize the payment for uh, Amherst Media's invoice um, for the membership for the trainees to do uh, our take over. We have a motion, we have seconded. Now we vote, yes? Discussion. Uh, or discussion? All in favor of, of doing exactly that? Uh, all opposed? 
Motion unanimously passes. Thanks, everybody. All right. Open meeting law discussion. Um, yes. Um, it's not open meeting law, but just um, we still don't have um, somebody to do minutes, and I think that we probably should. Oh. Since okay. the meeting's happening, so we should probably talk about that. Are you taking minutes right now? I am. I'm taking my own personal notes that can become minutes if why we should choose to have me be the minute taker. Ah, okay. It's, a, it's item nine of the agenda. <laughs> I see. Okay. So maybe we should pop that up to. Um, am I allowed to change the order of things on the agenda? But that's different. The, the communication secretary, recording secretary, it's different from the minutes. The recording secretary is the minute taker. Yeah, the recording secretary would be the minute taker, so right. we're wondering if we should talk about that first so that that person can then take notes at this meeting, or take minutes at this meeting, right? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move item 9 up and just shift everything else down a little bit. Um, so... We need to establish a communication secretary and a recording secretary. And we had talked um, before about having a recording secretary um, do what Diane, thank you so much, um, has already begun doing a bit, is um, taking minutes for the meetings um, and then working, I guess, with the communication secretary to send out anything that needs, or well, the communication secretary would then send out things that need to be sent out. Um, and all of that kind of things that all of the like administrative and communication stuff that happens between meetings. Um, can someone else add more detail to that who's got more experience in how to describe this in more official sounding language? Yeah. Great. I think a recording secretary should be none of us because if somebody's taking minutes, you can only be focused. It has to be somebody that does it professional and if you're taking professional minutes, then you're not participating in the committee. So it has to be somebody we need to ask for support. Um, to, to, it cannot be any of us. I'm not qualified to, to take minutes. I don't know. So I did speak to Mike on this question, and we don't have, he doesn't feel like the school has resources to provide someone and pay them outside of district, out of their time to, to support that. So his thought until we get an OPM is that somebody on the committee would do it until the OPM comes on board. Yeah. Can, can until the OPM use some part of the budget to pay for all? This is a 5 star T, so it's maybe one hour off the after time to use to pay. Do you mean, do you mean prior to the OPM being? Because my understanding is that the OPM, once we have an mm -hmm. OPM, they'll take care of the minutes. She means prior to. Oh, prior, prior to. to. Um, I, I would like to offer that since we don't have the resources to hire someone now until the OPM um, comes up, uh, the OPM will take care of minutes from then on. Um, what I would like to do as chair is that whoever becomes the recording secretary doing minutes, I want to work with them to find a way to make sure they have a voice where maybe they give me some sort of a signal that says, hey, I've got a thought, I'm going to finish typing this thing, and then I want to chime in, and I want to make sure to make space for that person. Um, and I'm happy to look out for that person specifically so that, you know, they can still chime in. Yes. I think maybe Irene's, Irene's point is that we have a budget for the committee, so rather than pulling on school district funding to support staff to come and take notes for us in the interim, are we allowed to access the budget that we would be using to hire an OPM until we do? So I don't know how the language of that budget is established for our spending. Maybe Mr. Delaney can clarify that a little bit. Are we allowed to hire staff? Um, I have no, that's really more of an accounting question. Um, I have no knowledge of what that's allotted for. I, I can ask the question. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's that was exactly what I was thinking. That we, you know, we do have a budget, and, and I think that it would be appropriate to have somebody do this. In addition, even when we have an OPM, that is not necessarily a service that is provided. Um, I, my understanding from the, the prior committee is that minutes were taken by a staff member even during the, the prior process. All right, so the OPM doesn't bring with them necessarily a stenographer or somebody who has experience in doing minutes. So 
Um, I spoke with Claire McGinnis, who's on the committee, um, just to see if she knew of anybody in town staff that would be available to do this. She didn't know of anybody at the time, but I think it is a very reasonable and probably very advisable thing to have somebody who's not on the committee see if, to, to hire somebody to take that task um, and do and do minutes for us. Uh, we don't know when we're going to have an OPM. We don't know what's going to be the situation. I think it's money well spent. So I guess the question is, how do we get to an answer right. about that? Um, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, the other committees I've served on have always had a town staff person who acted in that capacity. I've never really had to worry about how they were paid. So I don't know how to figure that piece out on my own. But um, for the next meeting or two, we might have to do just what we're doing mm -hmm. likely today, which is to do our best to record them. But it would be ideal to not have to do that for very long. Yes. One thing we have the advantage of is because we have filming. We at um, least have that record. They, yeah. Well, there, none, the, the, yeah, that record <coughs> is good, but it's not sufficient. But yeah. if uh, somebody somebody who was hired could watch True. the video and then, and then produce minutes based on that. Okay. Um, so I think that might be um, a, a, a temporary solution but I but I think this is something that we can and should get on right away and if that means uh, maybe speaking to the town manager and asking uh, for some help we're a new committee where we don't you know, we're learning the ropes we, we, we're learning <laughs> yeah. the ropes we need a little bit of help here well and there's a there's a little bit of a, a problem I guess I call it but probably the wrong word in which this is sort of an orphan duck right like the, the committee sits sort of between the school district, but it's actually spending town funds, right. and it's some, doing something on behalf of the town. But obviously, the recommendations funnel back to the school committee and to the school district. And so, I think, I think it's, I think it's precisely the challenge that it's sitting in sort of a bureaucratic nether world. Um, so, I think it's advisable. We can, we can figure this out. We should be able to figure it out. Okay. So, when when you said you were look into this do you know the people to contact about the question of whether or not we can use our budget to hire actually no no i don't know who i was <laughs> oh. I, I, okay. I would just ask until i found someone that could answer that I, i'm not i i buy things <laughs> i i don't i don't i don't i, don't, I have never hired a person i've never hired a person yeah. even on a temporary basis so i don't okay. know i don't know how to do that but i can find out okay awesome um let's you and i communicate also because i can i'm happy to reach out to you know, Mike and then beyond and whoever, you know, find out who we can go to, even though we are. I'd be really surprised if Sean Mangano mm -hmm. wouldn't know exactly who Sean the town hall the answer, to yeah. talk mm -hmm. to, who could sort of triangulate yes. how to solve the challenge of finding someone to help do I mean, he, he would be one of the first people I'd ask. Yeah, he's got to be able to figure it out. Okay. And even if, uh, I wanted to follow what Maria said, that if even if the person cannot be here because if it's after hours, if they could sit and watch the video during work, normal working hours to produce the minutes, that would be okay, I guess. Also, it would not be ideal, but that would be the second best solution. It doesn't mean that it has we have the video tape, it doesn't have to be here, it could be during normal working hours that they commit two hours every two other weeks to do the minutes. I wouldn't commit a staff member to that. No, but no offense, but it's not school business, so I don't know if we would be right to ask a school employee to, to do that work on top of their typically assigned duties. I don't think it needs to be a, a yeah. school. It just needs to be someone who knows how to do this. Sure. <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, okay, so it sounds like we're sort of at a standstill <coughs> with that. Um, Diane, for now, are you comfortable being on it? Yep. Thank you. person? Thank you. As long as everybody else is comfortable with that, too. Yeah, I'll do my best. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll take care of finding out more about the recording secretary role. Um, we still have the question of the communications secretary role. Um, this is somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense with the communications secretary is that that would be someone who ensures that you know, in, in collaboration with me, would make sure that the agenda goes out on time to the appropriate avenues where it needs to get posted, um, with the you know, with the town and the websites and all of those things. Um, that person might also. Um, look at minutes and then send out like a list of action items from that minute, from those minutes if there are things that each of us needed to go do. Like we have this one action item where we're going to go and find out um, about uh, hiring a minutes taker. 
Um, can someone else add to this role of the communications secretary if there are things like that that I'm missing? Yes. Uh, you had floated, some, someone had floated the idea at the last meeting of establishing a um, website of some kind, even a, even a blog. That would, yes, so. so that would fall under there. Um. So it's sort of internal communication, but also public outreach communication. Yeah. Um, there is later on the agenda an update from our brainstorming committee for communication and public outreach. Um, and the, the preview to that is that we talked about having like a little subcommittee of a couple of people who would support like community outreach kind of stuff. That's but having the communication secretary as the point person for internal communication as well as for um, being in charge of a web presence, um, that would be that person's gig. Um, do we have anyone who would like to be in that role? Or I guess, can I call for nominations for that role? Is that what I do next? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so are, are, are we sorry, we're clear about that? I could see the, um, the web master being separate from this communication secretary and almost would advise it so we're spreading the wealth around. I don't see how those two things are necessarily okay. that integrated. Yeah, those, those two can be separate things. As long as, <coughs> as, long as we <coughs> communicate together, that'll be fine. Yeah, and we can get two people there. Okay. Or so that, that there might be a communication subcommittee that works together to bring that out. Um, I wonder if we don't hear the recommendations from the brainstorming committee about what that outreach might be so that mm -hmm. people would feel more comfortable volunteering or not. Sure. Um, so I can do that. Uh, this is more rejiggering of agenda items. I uh, hope everybody's cool with that. There's no like official open meeting law, whatever. It's about order stuff that I can like. I can do <coughs> this stuff right now. That's fine, right? Yes. Uh -huh. All right. Yes. <laughs> Freedom. Okay. Um, so, uh, Irene and Heather and I met, um, and I took a bunch of notes. Um, so, we talked about. Um, mostly like ways to disseminate information about what this committee is doing um, and among many things that we talked about were things like getting in touch with school PGOs and seeing if they have like an email list where we can send updates school newsletters and the superintendent's newsletter where we can include like a little blurb about what's current here um, our website which would include things like um, links from the town and schools websites and PGOs that are relevant to what we're doing um, uh, and we were thinking about something like a once a month update blast that would go out through various a internet avenues um, with a summary of what we're doing, even if it's short. Because um, month to month, some, like sometimes there'll be a lot of updates and sometimes there might not be much, but at least people will be hearing from us on a regular basis. Um, we were also talking about setting up an email account. Um, and that email account could also have like an email list that we could then disseminate information to that people could opt into. Um, but from that email account, we could send the, that stuff. We can, that can also be an email account where the public can send us feedback to that email account. Um, and then we can look at that. Um, we, uh, right, we, so we were thinking about a Google form so people can sign up for the mailing list. Um, we also thought it would be really important to have translation for whatever blurbs we send out. Um, the school newsletters, or at least our school newsletter, is always translated into Spanish, but I know that within our building there are 20 plus languages that families speak at home. Um, and so I, I, I would strongly encourage us to talk with, um, with translation services and maybe with the Family Center and see um, if someone can help us out with that. Mm -hmm. um, we could also get in touch with the Amherst Bullet and the Hampshire Gazette and perhaps write something like two short guest columns over the course of the next year. Um, something where like, we're not like a regular presence in the newspaper necessarily, um, but where we had a couple of big updates that people could read that way. Um, we also talked about having forums in the first three months to take input fr and questions from the public, from families at the schools, um, and also to, you know, to share information. Um, we would need to set those dates fairly soon if we're going to book spaces. Hi, welcome. Um, and the <laughs> um, 
and I think the last thing we talked about was um, also the way the way that things are written. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be discussing here is written in very official and sometimes very legalese kind of terms. Um, one of the things that that I hope for in communications is that the way that we describe things will be accessible, not only in all languages, but also like specifically in the way we phrase things in English. In like I'm talking about plain language writing. Um, because no matter what it is that we write, like the vocabulary that we use has to be something that people who are not, you know, into all the legalese of everything can still understand clearly. Um, so we might have to do like a, hey, here's our official legal statement of a thing that we just did. What does this mean? This means this in plain language. Um, I think it would be really important for everyone in all languages reading it, including English. Um, I know that was a lot of stuff all at once. Um, folks on the brainstorming committee, Am I missing stuff? Do you want to add things? One of us posting documents that we... Oh, right. Posting the documents on the website, the ones that we have access also posting so that everybody is on the same page. Not only us, but the people in the community is also is on the same page. Yes, thank you. I had something, I forgot it. Okay. Any minute. Great. Anything that I said? Oh, just, I think it's important with all this public outreach to set specific goals even if we're not able to fill those goals. So when we talk about, you know, why to, why why are we saying two guest columns? You know, it's like, I, I feel like if we don't set some goals, we, it's just going to become amorphous and, and right. things aren't going to happen. So, you know, once a month might be say every six weeks. Or, you know, with the PGOs, like, our goal is to meet with, to hijack a PGO event twice, you know, or for each school, or just somehow make, you know, have a goal. Right. We can get those to be more specific. Did you? No, go ahead. So thank you guys for meeting and, and starting the brainstorming mm -hmm. on this. Um, I have two concerns. One is that a lot of the outreach is school-oriented, which is appropriate, but I think what, uh, we need to be cognizant that we have to be keeping the entire town informed as well. So. That means uh, town website, but it also means the general public and outreach to places, public places like the library or so on. It, I think that's important. I was also a little <coughs> concerned about how much of the communications you talked about is electronic. Email is not accessible to a lot of folks, and a lot of people are not uh, going to be, you know, on websites or on Facebook or what have you. So. Um, it, I, th I think we need to, I don't have a, I'm, I'm not positing a solution to this right now, but I think that we have to be really thinking about that and not assuming that email is going to get to the people we need it to get to. So. Thank you. The other thing I think it would be appropriate to talk about now too is, I mean, I didn't make it through that whole thing, <laughs> but the request for proposal, you know, some of this work um, that the, um, I'm blanking. The people we're hiring, the yeah, OPM, OPM, OPM yeah. thank you, is is hopefully they're going to help us with this community outreach and soliciting feedback and all of that. But when I was reading, so I guess part of that discussion is how are they plugging into that, if at all? Because reading like the request for services and in the contract, that kind of stuff really wasn't particularly spelled out in in those things, and and so do we envision them? Like, how much of this is our work until, and when does it get handed off? Does it get handed off? Um, that's my question. My, no, go ahead. my gut says that it's, it's mostly going to be our work <coughs> as, as the committee to keep the community informed. The OPM will help with, I think, kind of, inter you know, the committee's interaction with ultimately the, the architect that gets hired um, and the process. But I think there's, no, there's going to be no good substitute for other than us to get that work done. I mean, the OPM can maybe help translate it in, you know, into, into plain English at, at, at meetings and, and that sort of thing, but the real, the real job falls to this group, I think. So, yeah, essentially, yes. Um, the OPM is going to do what they're required to do by the contract <coughs> and by the <coughs> request for proposals. So if we don't ask them to do that up front in the bidding process, then they'll say, that wasn't part of the scope of services, and, and they'll be right. You could ask for it, but I, I'm guessing that most of these most of these firms 
that's not necessarily their strength. You would probably, if you wanted them to have somebody that's really good at publicity or communications, they'd probably have to hire someone, and, and you'd probably pay for it. So, I, I, I am skeptical that we could offload too much of, of those kinds of duties to the project manager. On the last building project, there was there was a public facing website. Was that done by the architect or was that the OPM? OPM. Uh, the OPM. The OPM. Yeah. And it was sort of a disaster. Like it my, was really hard. My my understanding of that is that it was kind of a glorified repository. It yeah, it really was not. Um, I don't know. I, so again, like how did, how would that shoot tail in with our website, if at all, or I don't know for so. I'm thinking that we don't know if we're going to know any of those answers until we hire an OPM. Um, and well, it could, well, we'd have to tell them mm -hmm. right. in the right. art. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about <coughs> time and lots of the other things that we need to discuss. Um, I also want to make sure that we have some sense that, like, this, with this position, the communications secretary, um, would be working with a lot of this stuff over a, a fairly large chunk of time, likely. But then that communications secretary would likely have a significant amount of input when we're talking about a contract for the OPM and whether or not this kind of stuff is included in that contract that the communications secretary can then hand off. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, you know, we still have to do this stuff before we have the OPM, regardless of. <coughs> yes. Um, so, uh, so we also, we're also sort of thinking about like a, a communication subcommittee. So all of this stuff, you know, it, it could be us, it could be one person if someone's feeling really ambitious. It could, a lot of it could go, or some chunk of it could go to the OPM. Um, but then if it's just us, we might have a communications subcommittee of like two or three people who are sort of, you know, dividing all these tasks in a many hands make light work with the communications department kind of way. Um, and that, I don't know, for me personally, that seems like more manageable than, than yeah. Well, I didn't mean interrupt you. No, it's just, okay. um, one, I agree with that. Because the way you were describing the communications secretary role, it sounded like they were being like we have a lot of stuff we have to do, and so then that person is sort of volunteering mm -hmm. to have all that work to offload it on them, and and yeah, that doesn't right. seem fair or reasonable. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me if we had a subcommittee that's working on this, then who's doing the, the monthly blurb and update? Who's doing, you know, how people are drafting the column can be sort of rotated, and then frankly, even for the columns, if the committee knows there's one coming up, it could bring it back to the committee and saying, look. You know, does anyone have the time to help draft something out that we could all, look, you know, that kind of thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think otherwise, because I think it, that realistically, it's going to be, it should be a committee task and it should be more than one person doing it, not just an individual. Because also, frankly, that's like a paid job, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do all that uh -huh. stuff. Um, and then the second question I have, which I think goes back <coughs> to the really horrible website that I found for the former project, and there were also dueling websites. There was like one website for the committee that went through ARPS and then there was a link to another committee that had some documents and in my personal opinion both websites were horrible and almost like they were almost like enemies of actually find I mean I don't mean it, this is where of course conspiracies come from right so I don't think I don't I'm not I don't actually think it was intentional that the website seemed to almost prevent you from finding information that was useful but it actually sort of acted that way right and so one of the other points I'd make is we're talking about hiring a, re a recording secretary if we need to. Um, I would point out that if we're going to put it in the budget to do a website, it might be useful to pull that out of the RFQ and simply say, why aren't we hiring someone now to help us design, or you know, now and updated when we have uh, you know, an OPM to create one decent website. Maybe not, but I'm just saying, let's why why we're, why do a, lousy website now and to try to offload a uh, lousy website onto someone else. I think that's what happened before. Um, we can hire somebody, but it's going to be usually people building websites, they charge a lot. That's my experience. Uh, and they can need the tenth of our budget can go into a website and it can take months because they do it customized. Or we can go uh, with the input of several like WordPress, 
clean tabs, and that is, uh, I think, easier and cheaper. And then you can modify accordingly. If it's not working, we can go and say, okay, let's modify and make it more accessible. If you hire somebody, it's done, and you don't have much control of it afterwards, yeah. and it's fixed. Um, and then it's also the delay. It takes, we will need to hire contract somebody. We need to put a call to hire. It's going to take a couple of months. And we're going to get and I think you said you could do that, right? The WordPress, yes. Then my point so is, we is doing? no, but, my, yeah. but I'm, yeah. because I'm not being funny about it. I'm just saying if we're no. not hiring someone else to do it, it's got to be someone around here right. who can actually do it. The the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, WordPress, I'm doing it already for okay. the PGO and managing okay. sure. the PGO. They give me the information, I upload it. It's, WordPress is like editing a doc, a doc document, essentially. That's it. Um, okay. it that's it how all the and the cost, what would, what would that cost? Uh, I think it's about $8 a month to host, and I think the name, I think it's $18 a year. Um, I look at it, uh, the, the WordPress, we can go from $4 to $18, depending on the service. So I, th I think it's 8 to $12 a month, the one that lets you have some gigabytes of storage. You can look at the numbers and send them around. But I think it's not more than... What would the committee think about trying that? If mm -hmm. it doesn't work, it's not that much money. We, yeah. if, if there's things that we could tweak, maybe some other volunteer from the community could say. Yeah. <laughs> we can open we can put up right. for the um, community to help us improve. And uh, one of the issues related to that is we can choose our the name and uh, the website name. Uh, open for it Fort River is open or Fort River building is open dot education dot com we can choose whatever we want and just buy. Cool. Great. So, this this sounds like the action item that's coming out of this is that um, you're going to look into costs yeah. of the website and, and bring those back to us. And I do I have the approval if it's made less than twenty dollars a month for Hosting and eighteen dollars a year, uh, or twenty dollars a year for the name to buy it and get reimbursed. Yeah, I think. I think. I don't know, think, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how how we go about it. You will really know. Can you buy the name? Um, and so, and I think this raises another. You know, you talked just about us being the orphan committee, and it's yeah. we also sit in a strange place financially because. Town meeting gave us twenty-five. Uh, I'm sorry, two hundred fifty thousand dollars to work with, but it's a subcommittee of the school committee. So, who owns the money? You know, and, and how I mean, how, if and if we and well, if we own the money, yeah. then how do we spend? You know, what? what, what it's what not like rules? a bank account. Well, so I know, how does that I, work? I know the school. I know the school district doesn't own own the money because every time I talk to. Mike, he makes it abundantly clear that it's not his money. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's the fair. town's money. What, yeah, it's, it's the, the town's town money. money. Yeah. Yeah. It, is, uh, it is the town's money. And um, So how will we go about setting and buying so the name and hosting? Any, so any, any purchase that you make, if you can make it to be paid within 30 days, the invoice would go to the accounting department and they will pay that invoice directly to the vendor. If the vendor won't do business with you without payment in advance, then you have to pay it and get reimbursed. It, but it's the same thing. A valid invoice goes to the accounting department and then they reimburse you. For services that are only for sale online and therefore require a credit card, the town does have a credit card for online purchasing only. This is online. The WordPress only works online. Um, should I go to town and talk to somebody so that they, they do it? I think it sounds more like we need a little bit more of like a formal proposal that says we'd okay. like to develop this. It will cost X amount. Okay. Like and have the actual numbers and then submit it to the town. Yeah. So I, I can vote on it. And, and, I can yeah. make the proposal. Same the proposal for before this uh, next meeting and yep. then it gets to them. Great. Um, hello, it was mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, 
you organize? Make a proposal to be submitted to the subcommittee, to the committee, and uh, to be voted the next time. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. That's great. Thanks for so doing that action item. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we have. I I have. We have questions about finding someone to take minutes. We have someone on the um, the web uh, mission. Um, would we like to also talk about um, a communications person internal with us and a communications subcommittee? I'm not sure about <coughs> like, the procedure and orders of how to establish these things. Um, I wonder, so if we have the subcommittee, then it would be the chair of that subcommittee that we would be voting for? Is that essentially what we're doing? Do I then open nominations for chair of the <laughs> communications subcommittee? Let's start the other direction. Right. Right. Who wants to serve, first. Who wants yes. to serve okay. on the committee? Great. Who would like to serve on the subcommittee? We're looking for somewhere between two and three people. It's not that I'm not interested, but I have a feeling we'll have some other subcommittees that might be getting into this deep thing. Um, and I have a feeling I, I, I could probably commit more time and, and be better ser serve the larger group looking at this big document, but if there's no one else, I'll participate. <laughs> So we've got Heather, who can be Heather's teammate for two weeks. I'll work with Heather. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Cool. Would anyone else like <laughs> like to join? I mean, is, is being sort of webmaster enveloped in, in that? So is that kind of by default? Was you there? <laughs> <laughs> I feel a volunteer happened. What? <laughs> You're volunteering me? <laughs> well, it's <laughs> voluntelling. <laughs> um, yeah. I can be part of the committee, and although I was going to be part of the voice posting, I was going, hoping to receive the information and post it, so that makes sense. It's kind yeah. of connected. Yeah. <coughs> no I would imagine all of us are going to be on some subcommittee of some sort, yeah. so anyway. Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I wish that. I okay. can see that forecast, and I don't know where my skills are best suited, so. I feel similar to now. Jonathan that my skills would be better used on another side. Which may be coming up at a different part of the meeting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like this. <laughs> there is yet time. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so thank you. Yay. Thank you. All right. So we have a team of three for our communications subcommittee. Um, I, now I get to take nominations for chair of said subcommittee, and then we vote on that person. Is that like the next order of events? Do we need a chair? Do we need a chair? Yeah. 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 It could be communal. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Never mind. Because I think the part of their job at times is going to be to say to other people who are not on that subcommittee, "Hey, <laughs> we're tapped out this month. We need you to write a two-paragraph blurb." Mm -hmm. What's going on? But we're cool. responsible for it. Making sure stuff happens. Exactly. Yeah, you'll you will ask said person, including me, to say, "Can you write that blurb?" And I'll be like, "Sure." Yeah. And I would assume, hopefully, maybe before the next meeting, we'll have maybe a set of goals written for mm -hmm. what. And then I don't know if that's something we want to vote on, or just get general approval for the goals for general the out. Yeah, oh. just a lot along the lines of the for outreach. Yeah, okay. along the lines of the we want to. We'd like to have two guest columns. We would like to have a binder at the library that gets updated with basically the same information that's on the website. Or, you know, this is our communication proposal. Mm -hmm. What do you all think of it? I think Heather raises a good point. And I think we should also look at it from the opposite end of what, what do we think the metrics for successful <laughs> communication is? Because I think that that would help define, you know, maybe those milestones of this many or that many or how or when. Um, so if we could agree on you know, what successful communication mm -hmm. would look like and how we would measure that it would be good. Can, um, can I make a suggestion? So, well, uh, actually, two things. One is to maybe put something, um, uh, put something out there on the town website to say, this school building committee is, is working. We are doing communications. We want to hear from you. What, what do you want to hear and how do you want to hear it? Um, and so maybe just to do a little bit of outreach that way and and find some of those answers. 
Um, and then I, should I assume that it's okay, I believe it's okay, open meeting law, we haven't talked about that yet, but for us to not deliberate, but if, if any of the folks on the committee have ideas as well, to fire them off to the subcommittee and say, hey, thought of this, maybe could you guys put this on the list? I, I assume that's copacetic. I think it's okay as long as you don't reach a majority of the committee. <coughs> it, would be, it would be ideal in that circumstance to probably send it to one. I mean, just the safest thing to do would one be to one. send it one one member of the committee and let them receive it on behalf of their committee and then share it with each other because okay. they're going to represent a sub quorum. I think the challenge would be to get too many people on there. It starts accidentally tilting and lighting. And also because yeah. the other thing that's probably open meeting law is you can't. Probably you already know this, but. If you if you start talking to a number of different groups or individuals who are below quorum, but it ends up reaching quorum, right? Um, that's also not allowed because it, it, you know, right? Yeah. So no. Cool. So that reminds me. How do we? How do we? Part of the ask this is related to communications. Um, how do we get an email address? And if we get an email address, because this is actually an official committee of the town, do we have a, a town email? I mean, is there a, does the town provide us with? And by us, I mean the committee. I don't mean individually us, but as like you know, the SBC at Amherst.ma.gov. Is there? Is there? Does that happen? Because it seems weird. Pardon me for saying this, just but I'm being very casual. Hi everyone. Um, it seems weird that we would have like a Gmail account mm -hmm. and have some yeah. sort of essentially private email address no. for what's actually official town business. Right. No, I think we, sh we um, can ask IT to establish Fort River SBC at yeah. AmherstMA.gov. And yeah. then uh, that would disperse to all of us? I no, but it would so. be a place to no. receive stuff. I mean, stuff. maybe you can create yeah. a rule and forward it to yeah. the, all 12 people. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but I think that would be hazardous in terms of open meeting law. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's more likely that somebody should take responsibility to read it and bring the results to the committee that's in an open session. Yeah, that's something that we talked about a little bit in the brainstorming um, team, that, that the communication subcommittee would be in charge of an email address and what goes in and out via that email address. Um, in, in my experience on a like, totally unrelated committee, we do exactly that. And then whenever there is relevant info, someone will say, okay, I got this email from so-and-so, we need to talk about this at the next meeting, and if it's something that we need to discuss, you can get in touch with me, I'll put it on the, the agenda, and we'll, you know, we'll make it happen. Um, but that way we'll dodge discussion that happens online, and, you know, feel free to send things to me if it needs to be discussed. Yeah. If it's unidirectional, so in other words, all, the emails are only coming in, so, you, we, you know, we can contact everybody on the school committee by doing schoolcommittee.org, but nothing comes back to that person. So right. would that be okay if it came to the, like how do you, what happens when, when that goes to you, when that goes to the school committee, it then. Well, then what, lit what, liter what literally happens is um, if it goes to the school committee at ARPS, it actually goes to Deb Westmoreland, and then she sends it out to everyone mm -hmm. on the committee. Um, but I, I, I agree with where, I think where you're heading on that that if a member of this committee <coughs> were to send an email out to everyone else on the committee expressing an opinion, that's an obvious violation of open meeting law. If a member of the public sends a letter to us telling us what they think and it goes to all the members of the committee, that's not a violation of open meeting mm -hmm. law. Uh, I mean, it would only be an open violation of open meeting law if a member of the committee then wrote back to everyone else saying what they thought of the letter. Right. But as long as, as long as it's entirely unidirectional, it's not a violation of open meeting law. So I think there should be a rule on the, web, on the email that it, whatever comes in goes to everybody. It's fair that, pardon me for jumping in, I'm sorry. I think, I think as, a, as a rule, that's a fairer thing to do anyways because it avoids the, I mean, I think if you put pressure on, the, let's say, the communications subcommittee to sit there and make essentially a decision around mm -hmm. what they think is worth sharing or not, yeah. mm -hmm. that leads down a very ugly road of people right. mm -hmm. feeling like they don't have common information. Yeah. So it's Plus it wouldn't be with uh, somebody writing to the committee would not anticipate that that was being right. filtered. They would anticipate mm -hmm. that that was going to the committee as a whole. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. So then can we, um, can we talk 
Can we have somebody from the um, communication subcommittee, maybe in collaboration with you, Claire, about contacting the town and seeing if we can get an email that we can then set to forward to all of us? Um, and we all as a group can agree that it will be unidirectional, that we'll read the things and not discuss them. And then, yeah, and then that's the next thing. That's, that's this thing, yeah. yeah. <coughs> There has to be a clear understanding we'd be violating the law if we did that. Right. We'd be absolutely violating the law if we did that. Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to get to that in a moment. Um, I would like to go back to this this only like still hanging piece of this communication <coughs> session is um, having somebody act as an internal communications person. Right now, I've been, you know, there are a few people who have been following up on action items and you know, and I'm hearing about that as the chair a little bit. Without, it's just like information without opinions of like here's this document kind of thing. But um, like, uh, I feel like I'm sort of the repository for things right now, and I've been following up on stuff and setting the agenda out. Can someone add to this thought about having a, com a an internal communications person among us? Do we need that? Is that something that is absorbed by me doing that as chair and Edena doing that stuff, doing some of that stuff as web person and communications subcommittee doing some of the stuff that we had previously thought might be the role of an internal communications person. I wonder if we don't start with what we have first yeah. and see how it works and then okay. decide if we need to tweak it. Okay, great. So I will table that for later. Thank you. Um, can, I would, I, can I just ask one question about that? So I'm just wondering, I have a bunch of stuff that I would like to share, right? And so <coughs> just documents officially that, that we probably should be reading as a committee. How do I get that to all of you? Send it to your new email address. No, because it's open meeting, meeting, no, because it's just... Mm. If, you're di if you're distributing, uh, let's say you find a newspaper article and you think people should read it, and you do not editorialize mm -hmm. about what you think, you don't write anything about what you think of the article, but you simply share it. That's not a violation of the law. So I can email the group, and it, it's not even an article, let's say, like MSBA regs. Well, no, 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 but, like say, but even even then, it may sound stupid, yeah. but if you say, I don't know, like number five is really important to read, it's particularly salient to our work, it's really important, that's already stepping over right. the line of essentially getting into debate. But if you literally send the MSBA regs, that's not like a violation. A regs. Yeah, it's you could you could send a, you could say here are a bunch of resources, you know here are a bunch of resources from the committee, and just provide links or attachments to them. That's not a violation of open meeting law. Okay, so that's good to know. Shall we have? I'm sorry. Shall we have a tab on the website that says resources, internal resources? It's open to everybody, but if people send me links, so instead of having sending emails around. People send me the links, I can post them. If you want, we can put subtopics, have one page with subtopics and <coughs> links to documents. Um, so we might you? need a Dropbox uh, associated, or we, I think we might get storage, but we can have links there, so then everybody can access it, even the public can have the same information that we have. That sounds good to me. I'm seeing right. a lot of nodding heads yeah. around. Sorry, just I need yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, cool. Um, unless there is anything else, I'd like to move us along to the discussion of open meeting law. Did anyone have last closing thoughts on communications e type stuff? Okay. And thank so you. Is there communications? Sorry. So, so communications, us three. Are we thank you. helping out with things like posting agendas to? to the town website, or if you're still going to do that? I'll, I'll be in charge of the agenda. I'm okay. happy to take that one. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for clarifying that, and thank you, everybody, for stepping up into various action items and subcommittees. And thank you. All right. Uh, open meeting law. So open meeting law is kind of news to me. Folks who know more about it, will you, uh, can someone volunteer-ish to guide us through this portion of the program? There's, see, we had kind of two documents on this. This is kind of the open meeting yeah. guide, but then there's the the four slide item. Oh, I only have one. 
perspective. Is there two things? Uh, um, yeah, that's, the, that's the other thing that we, you would have received when you were sworn. Oh, the oh, oh, yeah. 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 This yeah. is this is the thing that they hand you when you're sworn. Oh, that's what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's that. that. But then this was the thing that was sent around as like, this is a document for our meeting today. Um, I was just looking at the wrong thing. Um, I hadn't read this before, so I'm just looking through. Okay. It's hard to talk to a presentation you've never seen before. <laughs> I think that the other document, when you get at town halls, Actually explains all these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is just kind of bullet yeah. points. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is funny. This. Oh, it is. This is from our. This is from our retreat this last summer. As I was reading through this, I'm like, this is so this random. Is this is exactly like what we discussed at our retreat last summer. Um, and that's because it's from that. Look at <laughs> that. Well, I can talk to all this. Excellent. So I you. can remember it. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I mean, it's funny actually because I'm not sure this is the world's greatest. Um, presentation to use for a general audience because this was going over some particular issues we were having that we were trying to make sure that we made sure if we needed to that we followed. Um, so uh, starting at the beginning on the, or this could be the end, on the thing that says common concerns, uh, so, um, it, it, this was just explaining a couple things. I mean, one that um, subcommittees of, oh, how interesting, how germane, <laughs> subcommittees <laughs> of uh, formally established subcommittees of official groups also have to follow the meeting law. So we would have to have two of our three people show up to make a quorum? And, yeah, but you and also have to, have, to, you have, to, you have, to, you have to announce, you have to publicly post it in advance. You have to um, uh, do it somewhere publicly, I don't know, film it if you want to film it, but I mean, it's, the point is you have to officially meet someplace and you have to have it available to the public and um, by the way, the working groups are actually considered different. Task forces and working groups are actually more informal and, and do not. It's, the difference is if you have a standing committee of a group, you need to follow open meeting law. If you have an informal group, like let's say to get that you and I were tasked with writing something up, we could get together and write that thing up and not be subject to open meeting law. Um, and uh, anyways, so that's. So yes. considering, if, in my view, the subcommittee will be tasked with accomplishing things, mm -hmm. so are we actually much more of a working group than we are a committee for communications? It's, I see us as a task-based bunch of folks. I think it could be. No. Yeah. I think it could be. I mean, I, what What's can the legal distinction? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was, Good question. What, you know what I'd love to do? And I'm happy to volunteer. I haven't volunteered for anything yet, so I'm to volunteer for this. <laughs> I'm actually happy to follow up. I'm actually talking to the attorney who presented this slide. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to follow up with them tomorrow and ask and make sure I get clear, we get clarity around the question of whether this communications work is properly falls into which category. Because the entire point is about the law is you don't you don't get cute to try to. Right. I'm not saying you're suggesting that. I'm right. just saying <laughs> the entire point is you find out what the law is and you follow it based right. on what you find right. out, mm -hmm. not not the reverse. So I can get clarity on this tomorrow. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank yes. You. That would be great because I, I, I see otherwise it would be very hard to work being three people, two mm -hmm. people make quorum, we could not exchange emails. Um, no, 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 no. I, I, anything. So it would be very hard to function as a communication if we cannot send an email. Yeah. I, I, I agree, and the funny part is it may be a matter of terminology that mm -hmm. we started using yeah. the yeah. term communication subcommittee. Right. And yeah. the funny thing is they're properly used that could take on connotations legally that were unintended, both functionally and also legally. Right. But let's let's just get clarity around that. Yes. Um, Thank you. Because part because part of this, by the way, is that the distinction for this, the presentation we got was that was that in fact a working group doesn't have that same kind of issue associated with it. Um, but uh, I'll get clarity on that. Thanks. Yeah. And is it partly because the the, the subcommittee is kind of making decisions on their own, whereas a, a working group is yeah, really yeah. working on something, but they're presenting it to the bigger That's group. exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. Which is pr probably akin to what the communications are. Yeah. 
I think, I think it probably is yeah. too, but we can get that. So timely review. Oh, level of detail in minutes, executive session, motions adopted, executive session minutes. Well, we're not going to do executive session, I imagine. But anyways, um, in terms of level of detail of minutes, it, it's generally considered that most committees do much more detailed minutes than they actually legally are responsible to. That essentially you can summarize who was there, what time did it start, and then essentially if you take a look at an agenda, you can largely fill in what happened along with, you know, so-and-so made a motion, it was uh, seconded, it was approved, and then a light summary of the, the legal requirement is for a fairly light summary of what was discussed. Uh, it, it, the discussion we had was it doesn't need to be anything close to a transcript, but it does need to give you the gist, the full gist of the conversation um, that occurred. If, I think if you look at, at the school committee minutes that actually are done by Deb Westmoreland, and she often goes back to the video uh, from Amherst Media to fill it in, they're usually far more detailed than is actually legally required. But that's the point I would make is even if legal requirements are lower, public expectation is much higher in terms of the quantity of the information you're going to get. So that's one of those situations where you're likely to exceed what the law requires. On email and Facebook, this is just the warning that was made that uh, about how easy it is to fall into discussions via email and accidentally reply all and start getting into, into conversations and, that, and how, how it is, like, it's immediately a violation of the law. So even if you're doing it accidentally, it actually is a violation of the law, even if you try to remediate it. The key thing is to remediate it as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. In that, on Facebook, <coughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing. So if we end up having a social media site, it is actually, one, that's a good reason not to have one sometimes, mm -hmm. but also if you do have one, you, you can't just run around writing, and here's what I think. And actually, interestingly enough, if on Facebook you happen to be friends with, you know, friends, with a quorum of the committee or have a public site that you know that other members of the committee are going to, and even just on your own page, you start opining about business that is in fact going to come before the committee. So you can make all sorts of comments you want about sort of abstract questions around building buildings and what makes for a nice place to be, but the closer you get to talking about actual real topics that are likely to come for the committee, um, the more you're almost certainly violating open meeting law. Again, even if you're not meaning to, because you're opining before, and this is the key distinction here, is before the business comes before the committee. Mm -hmm. After the business has been voted on and deliberated on by the committee, then you can talk about it all you want, essentially, because it's not, it, you're not essentially prejudicing the debate um, or, or debating outside of the session. You know what I mean? Well, not prejudicing, but, but 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 engaging in deliberation outside. Yeah, I guess I just don't I, I don't know where you would draw the line of like okay this now is this decision is settled forever and ever and ever and therefore you can now talk about it. How do you know that that decision is settled forever and ever? I think you're supposed. To, I think the I think the answer to that is you're supposed to use more or less your your judgment. I mean I think. Not to bring up old stories, but I think the, the the thing that's hard to contemplate is like what happened last year when we had multiple votes on the same project, mm -hmm. where you know you could think you could reasonably assume it was settled mm -hmm. and then it wasn't settled. They could reasonably assume it was settled and it wasn't settled. Um, <coughs> but I, I think certainly for the purposes of this committee, I think it depends on what we're what we're doing. I mean, if we're if we're voting an invoice or if we're deliberating on the RFP, RFQ, and then selection of an OPM. Those things are more obvious, right? Because we know we're doing. We know when at the point we've had someone under contract, we know that's a settled issue. Um, the, I don't know. It's hard. It's 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 challenging. I think it's cha it's challenging. I think it's challenging. I mean, it's. I don't have a good answer for that actually, and it's it's something actually that for us, I had not given a lot a lot of thought to sort of broad questions of discussion that might come up. This came up recently for us around this question of whether the school committee was gonna vote a letter in opposition to the expansion of the Pioneer Valley Charter, Charter School. And then um, it occurred to me that any number of things I might post on Facebook as an ordinary person around like Betsy DeVos might be seen as somehow, can I, she's, yeah. she's really in favor of charter schools, <laughs> just to, for context. You know, it might seem like I was somehow 
engaging in that debate. And it never occurred to me before that somebody might construe it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so better to err on the side. Of better to better to, better err on the side. But certainly, when you have like official, this is the point that Mark Terry made. Our attorney was certainly when you get to stuff like having an official social media site. Oh my God, be careful because there's so many easy ways where you can you should assume that every other member of the committee has eyes on that thing, and if you're expressing an opinion or something like that, it's a problem. Um, and then open meeting lock up plates, hopefully we'll never have them. They're in that book. And essentially, there's all sorts of rules on how we're supposed to respond in a certain amount of days and stuff like that. Uh, also, hey, if we, when we do minutes, <coughs> going to the next page during the meeting. Um, if, you, uh, if we have documents that we're using for a meeting, the posted minutes should include links to, or certainly a listing to, but ideally links of any documents that were being used during that meeting. Um, again, helps the public understand what occurred. Um, for new and unanticipated topics from members, uh, this was a question about basically how can you add items to an agenda per, after it's been published. And essentially, you know, if there's an item that comes up as a matter of an emergency that the chair has no reason to know would have come up, then you, you can bring it up. Um, there's kind of a strict rule on that. Like if you, if, if you, you know, kind of like you know in your heart, like if you really know you could have known a, a number of days in advance, um, then you can't be cute about it. Um, but there are emergency things issues that come up. But, but on the day of, there certainly can be issues that members bring up that were important that, that um, you, you can allow for discussion. I think typically what people do is they might allow for discussion of the item but um, maybe not a vote. Right, and then like table the decision until and, the and, yeah. and it's it largely for public agenda. awareness of the issue that the public has a right to be able to know about something and come to the meeting if it was going to be discussed and if they didn't know it was going to be discussed. And I think that's another reason why you have to err on the side that if there's a topic that could come up that um, really can wait till next meeting, you wait till next meeting, right? They say you can publish it, people can be aware it happened, and then they can come to the meeting. And so there's these these a lot of these rules, which are all a matter of law, are honestly straitjackets on being able to function efficiently and effectively. <laughs> but they're the law. I mean, it's, they're not things you can get around, and you get try to get around them at your peril. Um, topics resulting from public comment, exact same thing. I mean, you really are supposed to schedule it for the next meeting, and not. Debate. And actually, frankly, when it ever happens, um, for public comment in general. It's, it, you're not supposed to be debating the public during a public comment session. It really is supposed to be an opportunity for the public to, to weigh in and be heard, not to be corrected, to be condemned, or to be whatever, be debated. Um, again, we're not going to have role executive sessions, so I'm going to ignore that. Um, on open meeting law postings, uh, again, this is just one of those things that it's an ironclad rule. Um, with <coughs> respect and love, since this is on camera, um, when we're working with the the hill towns, um, on I guess I don't know, anyone call them hill towns here. Our neighbor, our neighbors to the to the east and, and north, um, depending on how often their town hall is open and are able to post things, for the regional committee we get into all sorts of problems around the idea that what be, what would be 48 business hours for Amherst mm -hmm. won't work for let's say Pelham or something because. Their town clerks only in certain days, and so what sounds like 48 hours for Pelham, for example, regional meeting, often is in fact 72 hours because we, we you know, they can't get it posted. It's not in. You can't get it done for Amherst. That's usually not a. That's just not a problem. Um, but it's just it's an absolute and strict rule. And if you find out you haven't done it, then you can't have the meeting. You just can't have the meeting. Period. And you shouldn't even really meet because if you sit and start discussing stuff, then you very rapidly you start getting into actually debating issues and you can't do that. Um, I don't, the other stuff I mean on meeting format, um, the, the, what we learned was a lot of the stuff around um, around the format of saying, you know, at 7.05 we'll have a discussion about X or whatever or Y um, isn't really mandated by open meeting. A lot it's customary more than mandated. You actually don't even have to say you're going to vote on an item. You can actually just put an item on it. And, and choose to vote. I, I actually think if there's going to be an item we're going to vote, we should put it up, we should put it on as a matter of transparency. 
Um, I mean, it helps the public to understand. I also think, frankly, because the, the agendas, and this is going, this is blending open meeting law and not. I'm just saying, if you do one of these things, and it's the same agenda that's going to the, first off, the same agenda that goes to the committee is the same agenda that should be posted. It's completely wrong and probably illegal to have one agenda that goes to the committee and one agenda that's posted. I say that only because when I work for the state, all the time people would do minimal committee uh, agendas that would be really bare bones. It'd be like, they, you're, we're going to meet. And we're going to talk about manufacturing like we always do, you know? And it'd be, you, know, you wouldn't even know what was going to happen at the meeting when you arrived. And then sometimes the day of you go to the meeting and there'd be a much more full agenda of what was going on. That's too cute for words. And so the, and, but it's very common. It's very level. common. <laughs> and so my, my point is on this is that you're right, which means yeah. it's, it's obviously they, minimally. They don't, they don't hold themselves sometimes to the same standard. So, but they it's make obviously us, minimally compliant yeah. with the law. But my point would also be if you're sending an agenda to the members of the, of the committee, if they look at it and say, I don't even know what we're doing. Are we voting on something? Are we discussing on it? What's going on at the meeting? You've created two problems, right? You're not really being transparent to the public, which could definitely become a violation of open meeting law. And on top of that, it's really bad meeting facilitation because people at the meeting have no idea what's happening. And so I, when I, I'm being, it's all silly. When I became chair of the regional committee, I looked at our agendas, hated them, and basically started erring on the side of giving much more information. Not just because it's transparent with the public, which is awesome and that's true, but also so that people didn't show up surprised about what was going on, which I could see happening. So that's a blending of open meeting law and just good meeting practice. But my point is, if you do good meeting practice, you're probably over complying with the law, which is awesome because it means you're getting really far away from any possibility that you're violating it. Um, anyways, I think that was sort of it on that. Any questions? I mean, I, I, I've generally been trained and through the ringer on this. Yeah. Are there any questions anyone has? I do, and it kind of relates to the one of the items on there, the identification of topics for yeah. future consideration. So let's say one of us wanted to have an item discussed on an agenda. Who should we be communicating to that, that to and how? Does that go directly to the chair? There are two ways, there are two ways that it can be done and probably should be done. One, it definitely should go to the chair because the chair puts the agenda together. Um, and communications about agenda items do not violate open meeting law. Again, you have to be super careful because you can't, you can't even say, I want to talk about this, and then explain all the reasons why it's really important to you to talk mm -hmm. about it. Like, you can't do that. But if you're literally just saying, I'm just saying to the group as a whole, right. you could write to Nicole and say not only what it is, but also the 20 reasons you think it's important. That's not a violation of open meeting law. Um, the, but what I would argue, because we do this at every school committee meeting, is um, we we always put a, a committee planning um, item. Actually, there is here now, future meeting planning, item number 11. Um, we always put that, actually, I wouldn't say future meeting planning. I'd just say meeting planning or, com or committee planning. And that's and what, what I always use that as is an opportunity for members of the committee to talk about what they want on the agenda in the future I want to talk about because then it's done in open session and then the public can even see what we're talking about doing but I think but the point is it's not one or the other it should be both if in between meetings you think there's something that ought to be on an agenda you should oh, I, th I think unless Nicole I'm talking about stuff you're going to be receiving <laughs> I, I think I think the chair should always be open to receiving those things between meetings because what it also functions if you're doing it like with belt and suspenders in the meetings between meetings is a safety valve so that if agendas start coming out and you don't see issues that you want addressed addressed, how do you relieve the valve safety valve that says, I don't understand why stuff I care about is never talked about. What I'm either it's either I'm wasting my time, no one's listening to me, or what's the so it's the I'm not trying to be funny about this, no, but these things happen all the time in committees of all sorts, where people feel like, you know, the the, the agenda is just happening and there's a freight train running out of control, and I don't know why it's happening this way. And so the way you handle that is by creating mechanisms for people to sort of intervene either publicly at the meeting and say, I really care about this, you know, or 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 or, or both email as well, so you don't have to wait two weeks to be able to say, I, I want this talked about. Um, I'm looking at the time. It's yeah. 4.50. Um, I believe we still need to adjourn at 5.30 as planned. Um, so, uh, any last thoughts or questions on open meeting law? I'll be super concise. 
I'm like, I'm gonna go. All right, thanks everybody, cool. I'm gonna call that section done. Um, <clears throat> so, the next items that we have are um, the environmental study and the RFQ process for the OPM. Um, I desperately need a very short bathroom break, but I would like this to be a very <laughs> short break so we can get back here. Um, can we take like a four minute break or five minute break and then come back? Yeah. Sure. Closest bathrooms are through those double doors there and on the left and right, respectively. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, See you, you all. Second. Oh. Sick. Second. Thanks, everybody. See you in four minutes. I'd like us to all reconvene. Welcome back from our very short break. Um, so, our next two items are the RFQ process for the owner's project manager, the OPM, and the environmental study. Um, I know very little about both of these topics. Either of these topics, I guess. Um, who can lead us in the RFQ process for the OPM? Sense if I speak that. Yeah. So, um, of course, we had, we had slides last time talking about the uh, the steps for that. But it's essentially, the OPM process uh, <coughs> is supposed to be a qualifications-based selection that doesn't take into account price. That um, they, uh, it, it's supposed to be designed in a similar process, although it's not required to be exactly like the designer selection process under Mass General Law Chapter 7C. Um, so we have, the town has adopted procedures for that process. Um, so the next step is basically to decide what we want. Um, I, I had distributed to the committee uh, just the previous uh, project's request for proposals for OPM. Um, we can kind of think of that as a, a baseline or a, a template. <coughs> I, my primary concern coming into this uh, is based on some discussions I had just with the superintendent's office before this committee had even existed. But um, there was an idea that we could start the process outside of the MSBA process, but still kind of use their template and then slide into the MSBA process and get approval after a feasibility study has been done. I am skeptical that that is a process that is going to work, so I would really like the committee to, to seriously consider how they want to do this. If we want to involve the MSBA from day one, uh, honestly even thinking about an OPM uh, RF, RFP would, would be premature because we need to slide into their process and uh, sign up for their process and, and get on their docket. Uh, and if we want to just operate on town funds, then we should have zero expectations that the MSBA is going to let us in later. I mean, maybe it could happen. I'm not aware of it ever happening before. But uh, some people in the superintendent's office seem to hold that hope. Um, I wonder if we discuss that the MSBA process is the way to go. Would that be then a recommendation to the school committee and they would have to either debate and discuss and vote and give us permission to do that? Or is are we completely unilateral in that pursuit? My understanding is that the school committee it does need to be the, does need to present the that idea factor. To, to the MSBA. So really uh, on, honestly I'm not even sure under, strictly under the MSBA process that this committee should even be formed yet. Um, can I? Um, I should be calling on people. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's right. we'll, we'll do everything. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, my assumption, and I thought the conversations I had with the superintendent's office was that there was an assumption that actually very little the committee could do would be directly accepted by the MSBA. Mm -hmm. um, that it was possible, although not nothing is guaranteed. First off, nothing is guaranteed in advance. It is possible that some of the deliverables around, I don't know, like the environmental, geotechnical conditions of the site or something like that, might end up being able to be used in that other process that would say, and it would save obviously a very modest amount of money given the total scope of these projects, but it might save a little bit of money. Um, but that it's even conceivable in a worst case scenario that the MSBA might make 
uh, that, that you know everything happened from from the start, and um, and you know and I understand. I thought the committee, and I thought even frankly the town, I thought, understood that largely when these votes were funded, my funds were voted in last year, that that this was that we were essentially operating outside of the MSBA process. Mm -hmm. It's one of the. It's another reason why the, I thought that the town. And by the way, the school committee concurred with what the town decided, so there was no disagreement here. That it made sense to stop this process after the initial feasibility, so before moving on to a specific design and working out all the specifications for, you know, a biddable project, there was a hard stop on this. That's another reason why, if you look in the authorization for the mission, there's a sunsetting of this committee at the end of its process mm -hmm. because the assumption is this might very well not even be. Some of you might be on the other committee, but that a committee that actually built the building would would have to start over. Would have to would have to have a new committee formed. Some of you might carry over, but there's no guarantee of that. And that's not a political statement. It's a statement of like there's only one way to create a hard stop in this process, and that's to say there's actually a hard stop in the process. And so and then the, the further point was that I thought when the town voted the funds and the school committee moved forward with it that the assumption was that it was we didn't know how we were going to uh, fund a new school building or substantial renovations to this building um, but that, that there's a general sense of urgency to try to get answers to what the site conditions were the buildability so I don't know if it's a term of <laughs> different portions of the site, you know, and, and then the conditions of the building. And so the, the reason I'm saying all this is I thought the decision to say we should move forward and do this had essentially already been made knowing the risk that the deliverables could be very useful to the town, could advance discussions of what we want out of a building, help decide what we, you know, are thinking, but that might they might not factor into the MSBA. And, and so to my mind, what I was reading through, and I'll stop here because I'm not trying to talk too long. I'm doing it again. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> is that when I read through the document, what I thought was the RFQ needed to be substantially cut down and changed because as it's written right now, it's written as, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to build a building. Right. This is step one of building a building. Mm -hmm. I would argue that the RFQ should be written in such a way that it's clear that we're not building a building out of this particular process. Okay. And that what we're asking for is an OPM to help guide us through and validate the deliverables of the feasibility portion of it. So yes, I, I, I agree with what you said. Um, the money that was authorized for our committee to work had nothing to do with being directly associated with the MSBA. And this is one of the things that, this is why I was asking some of the questions. I've got a lot of information, a lot of documents having gone through reading the MSBA that I want everybody to have. And my understanding is that, yeah, this is, you, you don't go retroactive. Um, there would be an eligibility period that you'd have to get in, accepted into in the MSBA first, and then a feasibility study, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, if we were to wait for all of that, we, there, there's no reason for us to exist right now. So I think the idea is, yes, we need to get going on these things. We're authorized to have that money. We're authorized to do this. I think it's reasonable that not only would um, stuff like the geotechnical be able to be set if we if if uh, if the district applies for and gets into the MSBA for a project for Fort River, a lot of that information I think probably could be used, and the, and the MSBA would say, okay, you did this within a certain amount of time. That's great. We're not going to pay you. Right. We're not going to give you money for it, but it's great that you did it, and now you're ready to move forward. So. Um, I'm wondering, I, I agree that this, this RF, uh, you keep, you, RFQ, RFS, whatever, the procurement, um, I think it does have to be largely changed because this is a format designed to be used with the MSBA. I wonder if it makes more sense to look at what's been used for DPW or fire station or something like that, a project that, ha that isn't going through some state, you know, if there's, if there's some kind of template for that. Or we could just cut this down to what we want it to be. I also want to make a pitch for, um, so we have some folks on the committee who have been OPMs and have, so, you know, 
done this type of work. So I think that you know you guys can help guide us with some of that stuff until we get going. And I wonder if we couldn't write an RFQ, or whatever it is, for some of the things that we know that we need right away, like geotechnical. Like, can we do that, which would might be much easier for us to write and get going and start getting that information and start looking at folks, even before we have an OPM. The OPM is going to take a longer process, I think. I agree that an OPM will take a longer process. I think we should have one in place and that they're working with an architect and that the geotech is sub to the architect so that when we go out and take cores and drills and inspect the site, that we do it in a way that is conducive to what the buildable area of the the site is that we identify what it is we are looking for and that we're testing for things that we want to know the answers to and not testing for things that would then trigger like immediate reaction of we have to fix this it has to be changed you know if you're testing for a substance and we find it and we don't and it shouldn't be there that we have to go into immediate remediation that would cost a lot of money you know so I think it's a, it's a very <coughs> specific um, scope of work that needs to be delineated and the, the building site itself is fairly large you know so we just we don't want to be sort of haphazardly testing across the site so I think having the OPM and having a little more traction on what the feasibility study encompasses would be necessary before a geotech was engaged I, I agree with your eagerness to get the process going by I, I agree with Christine we need the, the, the OPM and the architect to help define the scope of work that the sub consultants that like the geotech you know, to help direct them where to look and look for the right things um, so that you know, you, it kind of builds layers of accountability you know the the architect provides an extra layer of accountability on top of the the geotech consultant and the, then you have the opm strip on top of that to kind of make sure that the right things we look for at the right times professional standards of care yeah so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confused. Wouldn't the architect need information from the geotechnica to say where it can be built and where? The, it's, and it's a little bit of because both. Because the architect is going to make a, either it has a preconceived idea, I'm going to build this, and can I see if the land works? Or I know that the land works, then I can build. So um, I would guess if, if I was building, I would want to know is the land buildable or not, or where I can drill holes. Um, so I would guess that just from, from my point of view would be the geotechnical data is first. This is the data, and now the architect can design accordingly because if he might spend time designing and then you find that the place is not suitable, then there's no point of spending time. Um, what the geotech really informs is the structural design, the structural engineers work, what kind of footings, what kind of dewatering needs to happen. It's not necessarily, um, you know, how, how far the foundations would have to go, what types of soils we have, their compactability. I mean, there's, there's so much information in the geotech report that is needed for the architect to do their work. But in order to pick, like, specific locations for the cores to be drilled, the architect needs to inform those locations based on some type of program and feasibility. And, and at least conventionally, the, your consultants and your technicians and your engineers would be part of a design, one design firm that is, typically, or, or consultants to that firm. Typically the architect holds the primary contract for all the subconsultants. Right. Yeah, they're not going to be separate people that are coordinating. They're, we're going to be, we're going to have one contractual relationship who will manage those other people. The, the geotechnical borings themselves are, 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 they're not without cost. They cost a, a fair bit, you know, and you want to make sure that you're, you're doing those borings in the likely places where you might do something. So. You, the architect may lay, lay out three or four possible quick schemes of, of where you could expand the building or where you could put a new building, and then you want to be able to test in those locations. You know that that area over there is wetland, so you don't need to kind of bore there. Um, it, they should ha happen in concert with each other. You'll, you'll spend less on, on borings if, if, if you kind of do it in that order, as opposed <coughs> to putting out an RFP for, for the geotechnical exploration when you don't know where the, the likely locations would go. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so I'm, just for the sake of argument for the moment, <coughs> assuming we're, we're still looking for, looking, meaning focusing on, 
um, doing an RFQ for an OPM. Um, what, what, Anthony, what's your view? And I mean, all of you, I mean, since you're doing procurement, I'm sort of collectively asking. Um, don't, do we need to, in your view, either find a different RFQ document or cut this down substantially? I mean, again, what I. Yeah. yeah. So I think Anthony presented the, this to us because we asked for it. Sure, and it's sure, a precedent, sure. mm -hmm. right? right? And I and I think it's a good precedent to take a look at, and you're right, we <coughs> need to be concerned with the information that goes up to the feasibility study. And I think, you know, this is an RFS, it's a request for services. And maybe we're really looking more at an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications, because we might want to know um, what qualifications the OPM is bringing to the table. We'll, we'll probably want to delineate that very specifically, rather than having um, the information that's in this request of services. It's a little bit different. Um, so I think developing an RFQ is probably the right way to go. I, I would say that, yeah. The, I think the NSBA document is probably really useful to inform us about certain things that we need to make sure we include or, or an idea of structure because that's the kind of structure that an OPM is going to anticipate receiving an RFQ in. But yeah, it's not a, we're not bound to it by any means, certainly. So then is our next course of action to put together an RFQ? Okay. Um, and is that... Is that you or is that somebody else? Is that, I, that's, um, that's, that's, that's the design. Do we have to figure out who committee. The, the committee? I think we okay. need to determine what the criteria is and the qualifications, mm -hmm. what level of qualifications that they have. I and mean, this talks about you know past experience, other projects, other projects for other types of um, funding sources. And it seems like knowing past projects, their success rate, Having references, you know, knowing who the team members would be, and you know, going through that interview process, all of that would be encapsulated in that request for qualifications. And then that request for qualifications gets publicized, mm -hmm. and then okay, great. Um, so then I wonder if we create some kind of working group, task group, of people who know how to write this kind of thing, um, who can put it together. Slightly more basic question. So is, would a request for services be a, sort of an in, initial thing, and then you'd, and then another iterative process for a request for services, like, or is it it supplements that? The uh, the request, whatever we're going to call it, because the the law doesn't actually say what this document is supposed to be called, but we'll call it request for qualifications. Uh, that is basically your foundational document for your relationship with whoever you contract with. So we would want to iterate on it as a, as a committee uh, until we're happy with it. And then once it's published, uh, it can be amended at that point up until we open bids. But then we're, we're very much constrained to what we have outlined in there. So when this, when this gets published, we want to make sure it's, uh, it's gold. And we're hiring all. So yeah. does that document also sort of define the scope of what we want done to make sure that we don't I guess I am just concerned that we don't spend these resources on something that would have to be redone when we get into the MSBAQ. So, so we know there's a lot of work to be done evaluating this site, and I think that's what the, you know, that's what our charge is. But not designing a building based on a program because the MSBA requires that to be done their way. So, is so is scope of services in the here's the work as well as tell us your qualifications in this first document? I mean, what I'm hearing from Eric and Maria is that we're spending the money whether or not it can be used in the MSBA process later or not. It's We're doing a feasibility study, so it, it, we're not really tied to that MSBA process at all or what they require. So doing the feasibility study is evaluating this existing building along with the potential of building a new building if that's necessary. So, it, I mean, it sounds more to me like what we've been charged with in the feasibility study is a, is a building evaluation and a building site evaluation. And I think those are two separate things, but they can should be handled by the one entity. So, we would... Yeah, I would agree. And the other thing we always have to remember is 
we hope that one of the outcomes is that this site is in fact feasible, but sometimes a feasibility study says no, it's not. And so in a way, the town may have to learn the hard way with its own money that the site isn't feasible or is feasible um, before it goes into the, the state's process. Um, and if we discover the site's not feasible for some reason, then at least, I don't know, we've learned something. But it's, it is very possible well, that we won't get to In terms of not buying the same feasibility twice, that, that finding it not feasible is we wouldn't buy that a second time because right. we would start with the MSBA with a different kind of application right. or a different site and a different something. So that to me, so, I mean, so I think that sounds less risky that we are, um, so I, I don't exactly, I don't understand this process well enough to be as far out on a limb as I feel like I am right now, but I think it is important that we define this scope and proceed as if we expect to enter an MSBA process with the results, not expecting to have to duplicate or or build a school without MSBA because the town cannot cannot do that. So the sure. things I imagine that, that the MSCBA would, would not, you know, use out of whatever we do if we're doing it outside of their process are any sort of you know footprint designs that, that the architect we might hire comes up with. I they would not expect that they would accept, you know, the boring information, the geotechnical information, any sort of building hazmat survey that might be produced out of this, because that's good data to pass on to anyone who would follow. Um, but any kind of conceptual design, they're just going to set that aside. That didn't happen right. as far as they're, they're concerned. Right. So yeah. factual, sorry, can I pause this for a moment in the interest of time? It is now 517. Um, the other item on our agenda was environmental study, and I'm thinking that, may, that unless that's time sensitive and I'm not aware, I'd like to put that on the agenda for our next meeting so we could get a little bit more closure on this, do a couple of minutes of committee planning, and then adjourn in a <coughs> time fashion. Can I, can I see like a show of nods about if that works? Mm -hmm. Great, got a question. I have a question about the environmental study, and I think we were hoping to hear from Mike Morris or the town because the money was granted not for an environmental study on this building, but for other buildings as well. So there was question who was going to undertake, and it was maybe discussed in last meeting that maybe it was not the purview of this committee to be in charge of the environmental study, but it should be done by the school committee. Okay, so I can I can follow up and contact Mike about that, but he's. He's not going to be here at all this meeting, so we, he can follow up, I think, on the you're next You're talking about the $25,000 yes. capital item to study Wildwood? That is a town capital item that doesn't overlap with this committee at all. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So, um, yeah. But also, it was Wildwood and for River, but nothing has happened. It was, this was in March. The town meeting approved the funding in March. And that is information that we would need for this committee. So, I think the Wildwood item is separate and distinct. Mm -hmm. This charge is about Fort River. Yeah, yeah, but the 25 was not just Wildwood, it was Wildwood and Fort River. It's not. It's labeled Wildwood or okay. Health or whatever it is. I'm going okay. to pause this discussion in the interest of time. I'm going to follow up with whoever knows more about the environmental study and get more clarity. My guess is it's Mike. He'll be here at our next meeting. I'm going to put that as an agenda item for our next meeting. Um, Let's have another like two or three minutes on on this topic of the um, the RFQ OPM situation, and then we're going to have to move along no, and adjourn okay. soonish. So, um, so the, just in answer to your question, Clara, th there it's exactly what you're saying that there's structural assessment. There's in terms of what it goes into the MSBA process for the preliminary design program. That's the first thing that you did the hazmat materials, the phase one environmental site assessment, preliminary geotech report site, landscape, existing conditions, systems report, and structural assessment. All of those kind of things, if they're done in, I would imagine, a timely way relative to when you get in. I, I, I think that those are things that would not have to be duplicated necessarily. I mean, this is an opinion that I think this on, you know, nothing except for it makes sense, then we wouldn't have to repeat that. With the MSBA, and I'd like to actually have the MSBA just be like a topic of an agenda item for a future meeting. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing that you do 
in order to get into the MSBA process. It has anything to do with like here is the building that I would like to build. These are ideas. It's it's all about this is a, this is the problem we have. We want to get in. That's literally all that is involved in asking to be into the eligibility period. The eligibility period is going to open for 2018 on January 5th. So and it's going to close in April sometime. So that's when the district would be writing up a statement of interest and submitting it during that window for, for future times. But it would have really, it, it, it would have nothing to do with what we're doing in our, on our committee, if that makes sense. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the work that we're doing would help if, if we got in and we were going to do it. The work that we do wouldn't have to be duplicated, but our doing our work would have nothing to do with our getting into the process. Okay. Um, with, with the exception that when we were discussing this and, and also presenting at the town meeting, the scope of work went through all the things you just described up to also sort of roughing out um, conceptual options that could be considered for, for building. Uh, everything from doing renovations to the existing building, partial demolition and construction, to complete demolition and, and new construction. And, and it's, I mean, you, you're the experts on this, I'm not. I'm just saying, but my understanding of it was that would come out with some sort of roughing out of the concept, roughing out of the locations and the viability of those locations, and sort of an order of magnitude of what it would likely cost for those different options. And, and in order to do that, you have to have some concept of, a, of an educational program that is, is giving shape to why you have so many lab spaces or a different kind of library than you have now. And so, you know, as we had been discussing it, as I think it had been discussed at the town meeting, I think we have, I mean, just I'm just laying it out. I think we had discussed it in a way in which there were some portion of the expenditures and of the deliverables that were associated with this work that we hoped would be able to pour it over into an MSBA pro process because hopefully the information is, is, you know, straightforward enough information that would be usable. Um, there's also not a guarantee that it would be usable because it's up to the MSBA to decide what they accept, even if it is logical, but we'd assume maybe some of it could be. But that, that last sort of mile of deliverables associated with the different options almost certainly wouldn't be accepted by MSBA. That would be almost certainly so-called wasted money in that regard. But um, I mean, if this committee wants to make the decision that it doesn't want to do that, it can. I think from what I remember from what both town meeting discussion as well as the school committee, I think we were openly accepting the risk that we were doing. And partially because it frankly informed, sorry, just, just to lay out the logic of this, part of it was because we didn't actually know, we don't know what the future brings, and so we thought it was more useful information than not to at least understand what could potentially be done to the site and the building and what the different costs would like be associated with those options. I agree. I think we're, we're given money, you know, and, it, and that money was not contingent on acceptance into MSBA. We were tasked with coming up with those preliminary ideas. So I think we have to do that. Thanks. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to move us along. And I wonder um, if so this sounds like the next action item is for f folks who know to write the thing, um, in, in my most basic, like not actually quite understanding the book how to run this. Um, would you be willing to do that? Do we have other volunteers who could get together and work on that? As uh, like I'd be willing to work on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. Yes. Awesome. And I and I think it's not so much writing the thing as maybe defining some categories that yeah. we should discuss as a group. And okay. yeah, because we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk it out, really, and then there'll be the writing. Right. <laughs> sort okay. of. Okay. So then, um, do you three want to have? I think my meals. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. No, I wanted to volunteer. Okay. Yeah, oh, great. good, cool. All right, great. Um, so after this meeting, um, if you all make sure that you've got each other's contact info, and then I, I'll put on the next uh, next meeting's agenda that we'll have an update from that working group. If if you guys meet between now and then, but if not, I'll just get up to see you. Yes. And I'm not I'm not volunteering for that group. But but one of the things that I noticed in here too, 
was that there was a statement of sort of a general building description in some known building conditions and stuff like that. To the extent that your group finds, that I mean, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that in an RFQ we're going to have to have at least some kind of description of the site and the building that we're talking about um, and how it's currently being used. Um, since we don't have here, obviously, they use the existing statement of interest <coughs> and just attached it as an appendix that included basically everything somebody could want to know about the building. In lieu of that, I think, I don't know whether you guys want to contact or whether you want to contact or I should contact. So we should we need to talk to Mike and find out where we have, or do you have it? Your principal, maybe you have kicking around. I mean, where we have, like, the description of the building that we could try to use to insert in the document. I don't know if we have it off the rack, in other words. Yeah, it would be a facilities management thing, um, and we're in the process of bringing on yeah. somebody new, yeah. so um, I can see if Mike can access it, and if not, maybe waiting until that person's on board. Um, I, I did ask Mike for what was had been done. I went to the town meeting, to, to the town website to ask, look at the permits, building mm -hmm. permits for the building, and there was very, very little information about what had been done to the building. So I think that's something that we definitely need or we need to, we don't know when the facilities person is going to be hired. Is it going to be? Um, Relatively soon, I believe. The, the, town, the town for town buildings has a building report. I would imagine there's probably something existing for the schools, so. I was I was really raising it as the to do list item because since it clearly yeah. is something we need for the RFQ and we don't have that information but someone else does, I was really raising it as an immediate sort of task that mm -hmm. we should get on asking someone for it so we could get it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You'll reach out to Sean Anthony because I can do that as well. I can take Okay. Thank you for taking that on. I haven't liked resources the application to the MSB for the last time was a minute before. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was being there, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. So, um, unless there's anything urgent and like emergency about that topic, I would like to move us along to committee planning. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, our next meeting is Thursday, January 4th. Um, same time, Allison was unable to make it because she works until 5 and she requests that we meet a little later, but she recognizes that if most of us want it to be at this time, that she is willing to yield that. She might have to step off the committee then, but there's that and I told her that I would relay that to here. Um. Speaking selfishly, this time is perfect for, for me because it gets later. Uh, two little ones that are just down the hall here that I have to go pick up right now. Um, so doing it towards the end of the work day is, is, mm -hmm. is best for me personally. It works perfectly for me as well, because we end work at 3.30 here, technically anyway. But, um, I think we should keep that same meeting time for the January 4th meeting, and maybe at that meeting we can discuss when our next one will be. Yeah. Are folks comfortable with that as far as like yeah. planning goes? Great. I yes. can bring up one item for the next meeting. Um, one issue that the committees they are going to have to look is about the budget. Um, okay. And on the interest of that, I don't know if it makes sense that people do some research and look at other buildings that open classroom have been renovated um, so that you have a scope about how much has been spent on open classroom. Everybody, do, you can search okay. online, you can find places or so I'll write down that budget is budget and kind of scope of things could be an item for us for next meeting to talk about and then talk about people to then go do that research. Or we can talk before, can they, people can start looking before coming and so there's an idea. Maybe. I think at this point, since we're, okay. we're very close to over time, we can't, I, I am not comfortable rushing us through establishing a committee of a, sub, or a working group of people to do that research. Um, I don't know if anybody else is... Do people have other thoughts on that? I think it's new business. Yeah. We described okay. earlier oh, that new sorry. business is discussed yeah. the next budget. It's okay. a big topic. Yeah. I mean, cool. But, it, but also, that. that doesn't stop the ring. If, mm -hmm. if you have resources that other people, it's just the comment earlier. I mean, if you have resources you think, mm -hmm. if you find stuff that'd be useful for people to read, okay. you can share it. You should share it. Okay. My point was I have some, but if other people have, like, sure. everybody should share with everybody. 
the resources so that we are all level equal to this. Right, right, exactly. Um, thank you. For, thank you. For our next meeting, I will send out the agenda. If anyone has other thoughts, I've, I've sort of kept a running list, and I'll read the minutes in case there's anything I missed, but please email me. Um, if you did not make a name tag, please do, and I will save these here in my classroom, and I will bring them to our next meeting, oh, and nice. then everybody will learn each other's names. Um, here, uh, here works. Great. I would love to meet here again. Are we allowed to meet here again? I believe we are. Great. Sweet. Yes. It's going to move to the first before we loop, before we just walk away before we properly vote to adjourn. I hear a motion to adjourn from second, second, second. Fabulous. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>